So I think I would like to say thank you to all of you for coming. I think it's wonderful that you're here, but I would like to turn things over very shortly to three very talented women who have been putting a lot of their time and energy and work into making a marvelous documentary that's going to help us understand some of our history a little bit better than we ever would without it. I think it's just, uh, and every, they've been bringing us stuff for a few years and it's always fresh and new. And I just am amazed at their creativity and the way this film is developing. I think it's just marvelous. So we have with us Holly Hay from Theater and Film, Ali Day, from Disability Studies, and Lee Fernside, who's a, a producer of the HIV in the Rust Belt. And so I think without further ado, I will turn it over to you three, and the rest of us shall listen. That sound good? Yeah, thank you. Hi, thank Ellie. You. Um, uh oh, there goes my doggie. <laughs> um, Lee, are you going to turn your camera on or not? <laughs> There's, oh, okay. Jeez. Yes. Yeah, so, so thanks everybody for tuning in for us. Um, yeah, a couple of years, a few years. It's, it's, um, it's both going very quickly and also it seems like a really long time ago that we started this. Um, today we're going to watch an excerpt from Tashina Jackson who is a participant that we initially interviewed back in the beginning of all of this or what became the beginnings of all of this. And then we were able to reconnect with her this summer and do a location interview at Savage Park, which is her, um, her home stomping ground, so to speak, the area where she grew up. So what I'd like to share today is just a 16 minute um, interview portion <clears throat> from, I think we were with her for two hours this last time. Um, but she's talking about her HIV status, her understanding of HIV in the early years, and um, her just uh, life experience with HIV up to this date. And then after we screen the work, we'll open it up for talk back, and Ali, our humanities scholar, can frame it uh, for us as well. Um, and I have two ways for you guys to look at it. You can stay on here with me and I can stream it from my machine or you can go to Vimeo and I've just put a link in the chat. Um, please note that on Vimeo, there is a typo in Tashina's uh, name. I spelled it T-A and it's actually T-I-S-H. So, but that's the only difference. I just corrected the spelling error. So what I'll do now is I'll share my screen and I'll, um, I'll start the, uh, uh, the excerpt, and if we have more time, and if Ali has time and willing, I also have a second excerpt, which is um, not quite as long, it's 10 minutes, and it's specifically targeted at her experience with David's House Compassion. For those of you that don't know, which was a grassroots facility in Toledo, um, a hospice and, uh, facility that helped people with HIV and AIDS get access to healthcare community, um, and other support services. So, Ellie, did you have anything you want to add? Um, no, I'm excited to see um, how what what you've clipped from the Tashina pieces that we have. And after the after we watch um, the clip, I can sort of provide some more framework historically about why um, Black women became such a large population of those living with HIV here in the United States. And this is a teaser for a December 1st screening that we'll have at the uh, Toledo Library. And Allie can give us more logistics details on that because she's been the coordinator of that. Um, but here we go. By the way, this may make no sense to most of you, but there's no color grade on this at all. It's, it's, it's all raw video. So it's gonna look kind of flat and washed out, uh, but it's supposed to. Oh, that's the wrong one. Hold on, let me toggle over. Okay.
and shout out if you can't hear the audio. It was it was harmful. It was hurtful. Like I said, the the person just spread them like flyers all the way around the neighborhood and things like that to make me, um, you know, to hurt me. But after that, you know, I just didn't care anymore. It was kind of over with. I mean, it was out. People knew I wasn't afraid anymore. It took me a long time not to be afraid anymore. Actually, um, I did go into hiding. I did go into seclusion when I was younger. Uh, when I first found out, you know, but I had um, an awesome team, you know, standing beside me. Um, I had support system from family and friends. Um, then after I found out I was pregnant, which was what made it all the worst for me in my mind was that I thought something was going to happen to my daughter. I thought she was going to be, you know, taken away from me. I thought all the horrible things that you would think. Um, when you find out that you're HIV positive, but none of those things came to fruition. None of those things happened. It was just like all in my head. So that's why I always, you know, try to tell people, you know, newly diagnosed people, you're, it's worse than what you think. You will get over it. You will surpass it. It will take you some time, but you will be able to hold your head up high in the long run. It gets better community stigma. So many people, you know, want to hurt you. They want to out you. They want to do negative things to you to make themselves feel like they've got one up on a person. Um, in my head, people were saying hurtful things. So I was listening to what they were saying and beating my own self up about something that was out of my control, actually. Um, I did had a lot of therapy. <laughs> I had a lot of therapy. <laughs> it's a day by day process. You have to talk yourself into it every single day. Um, taking your medication, eating right, eating healthy. You have to do these things every single day so that you can be a better you. And that's the goal for me to every day wake up to try to be a better person than I was the day before. I'm okay. I'm okay with who I am and I'm okay with what's going on in my life and I'm okay with my status even if other people may not be okay with it I'm okay with it I knew a few people that had passed on from HIV but it was always a hush hush don't talk about it you know whisper about it I have relatives that passed on from HIV um it, it, it was nothing. It, it, you didn't talk about it. You didn't mention it. You didn't bring it up. It was just such a quiet, quiet conversation to be had. It was always kind of like a whisper. But um, once I found out, I was kind of vocal, you know, about it. Vocal about, hey, I got to go to the doctor this week. And, you know, just constantly saying that made people in my family realize this is what my life was. This is who I was. This is what was going on at the time. So, um, but yeah, like in our community, even still in the community with everything that's going on, it's still a really hard thing for people to come out and say, even now. And it's really sad, but that's why I speak all the time. Anytime I'm available, I can do that. I will do that. I have no problem with that because, you know, some people need that. They need that support system and they don't have that. People talk a good game. They say, oh, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But in our community, people need to just be honest with themselves and be honest about what's going on in the community. Um, no, I can't speak for all black people, but I can speak for a lot of people when I say if you can just put yourself in another person's shoes just for a moment and imagine yourself being positive, imagine the stigma that would come towards you, imagine friends and family shutting you out, closing the door, not letting you spend the night. 
um, not letting you use plates, all the ignorant that is attached to it. And you see it online, you see people say negative things and they're just saying things out of, um, out of ignorance. And that's the only word that I can keep using is because that's what it is. It's not even asking the other person how they are, what's going on, if you know this. If you have a friend, your friend's positive, she needs that support, he needs that support. You have to be able to love unconditionally. And I know it's kind of hard to say and people don't do that anymore, but it's actually, that's what it is. You need to have unconditional love for like the next person. And if we had that in our community, if we had that so strong as to way that they go to party and to go hang out and to go do all the unnecessary things, if they would just come together. I know I see a lot of friends, they have a lot of marches. I mean, it's really great and the fight is every single day. We have people that are in the trenches that are marching, that are doing all the positive things that we have. And then we still have people that have no idea what pill to take, still have no idea they don't want to tell anyone because they're afraid, afraid of someone knowing. And it's such a heartbreaking moment when you talk to a young man and he says, I just don't want to tell anyone. And you ask them why. And he was like, because I'm afraid that they'll do something to me, that they'll hurt me. You know, I um, do a lot of outside freelance work with young guys and talk to them on one-on-one -on -one basis about why they should come out, you know, why they should get into clinic, why they should get into treatment. And it's just a fear. It's just a fear of others knowing. And I don't know how to get around that. I don't know what else to say, but you know, that it's gonna be okay. It's harder, it's, it's worse than you think it is. You know, you will live, you will go on from this. But it's, at this time, it's just really hard to try to get through to people. I remember when HIV first came out, I was sitting on the bus and I was listening to a group of people and they were having a conversation. And one of the guys said, well, they should just take all the people with AIDS and just put them in one country. At that moment on the bus, I couldn't show the, oops, I'm sorry, I couldn't show the sadness that I was feeling, but it was such a hurtful thing. And I've heard people say the same thing now that if you're not vaccinated or if you are vaccinated, you should just go away. You should just put you in a box. We should just take you and put you in the camps and all these ignorant and negative things that are people are saying. And they're not even looking out for each other and how each other feels and hearing the other person's opinion or taking into consideration the other person's feelings. You know, some people are just not ready and some people are very ready <laughs> so it's kind of like the same thing you know it's kind of like the same thing I don't ask another person their status I don't want them asking me my status I don't want them asking me if I'm vaccinated or not I don't want them to ask other people those questions those are invasive questions but in today's society it's really hard to maneuver who you're standing next to, what's going on in their mind, what's going on in their head, until you open up your mouth and you have one conversation. You have to have a conversation. One conversation at a time changes everything. It's terrifying because you, you, you're expecting that person to treat you horribly. You're expecting that person to um, turn their backs on you. I've had two different instances. One where I disclosed the status to a person and that we weren't even intimate. I just disclosed it beforehand and that relationship fizzled. And then the second one that I ex uh, disclosed that information to turned out totally different than what I thought. So just having a conversation, sitting someone down, you know, it's just like, you know, real casual conversation. Do you know anybody who's HIV positive? Oh, no, I don't. Well, you do now. That's just me.
Well, you do now. But I'm going to let you know me first. I'm going to give you my personality. I'm going to give you who I am. I'm going to show you that I'm a regular person, just like you. And then I'll let you know. You know, do you know anybody who's experienced HIV? Do you know anybody who's passed away? Do you know anybody who's still living? Do you know what you equals you mean? You know, I, I have those little conversations. What does you equal you mean? Oh, no, I don't know. Well, let me show you. I got some information for you. I'll forward it to you. I'll, you know, do those things. But I tell everybody, like, if you don't know, this is your problem. Before you equals you. I wasn't able to, you know, I was married. I was married twice. So both my husbands knew. <laughs> my son says that twice. Yes, I was married twice. So both my husbands knew. And my first husband, I told him right off. He was like, oh, okay. So what are we going to do about it? And I'm like, that's up to you. You know, at this time, we can still start, we can still continue practicing safe sex, but that's going to be the decision that you're going to have to make whether you want to or not. So um, both of them are negative. I didn't have to, you know, have that really hard conversation with them of how I would have felt if one of them would have been positive. I haven't, I haven't had to experience that with any relationships that I have because I don't practice like that. You know what I mean? Um, a new relationship, I don't have them too many because at this time, I'm just trying to focus on me. <laughs> I'm just trying to focus on being the best me, being the best grandmother, you know, being a, um, a good supervisor, you know, the things that you learn no, later in life. That's me. I'm just trying to do that. But I, I, I'm a lot for a lot of people, a lot of men. I know who I am and a lot of people don't. And it's hard to realize that I'm as strong as I am. Some people see me like, oh my gosh, I'm not messing with her. She's too much for me. <laughs> and then some guys try, but again, I'm too much for you. So back up. And then I you know, have friends, you know what I mean? I've had friends that I've told and my friends are fine. My guy friends, you know, we don't have any issues. We don't have any questions, comments, or concerns because I'm going to ask, answer all your questions if they have any. I take my medication. I stay out the way. You know what I mean? I try to be involved in as much HIV-related uh, issues as I possibly can. Like um, we have an event. I'm willing to go. Training sessions, anything like that, I'm always down for it because education is always good. Like I've made a lot of friends, you know, that are advocates in HIV. They've gone to Honduras, they've done all these great things and I would have not been able to reach out to these people, you know, had I not, had I been in a different mind space. So that's why I do it. That's why I try to be, um, befriend everybody to make sure that you're not alone. You know what I'm saying? We're all like-minded, we can have conversations you know, and like I said, I do have a good support system with friends and family. So, you know, nobody brings it up anymore. <laughs> for me, it's like old news. Nobody's bringing it up. It's, it's weird for me. Like if, if you come to me and I'm telling you to get into therapy and I'm talking to you and we're having these conversations, nine times out of 10, you're gonna take your butt to the doctor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure that you know who to reach out to. Even if I have to give it to you anonymous, anonymously, I'm gonna send it to you. So reach out to this doctor. You don't have to tell her that you know me, just go and tell me how, how it is. So don't say anything, don't say that you know me, don't do anything, just go and get tested and get treated. That's all you, you can do. And once you do that, then come back and have a conversation with me, tell me how you feel. And I've done that and it's worked. So I've done that with a few people and it's worked. And they're in, 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 in otherwise they were like, I'm not going back there. I'm not going back there like why you know having the conversation with why because I don't feel this way and I don't feel that way I don't feel that I see my own people I don't feel that that doesn't matter what matters is your health what matters is your life what matters now is that you get into treatment and you stay into treatment so you can become undetectable that should be your goal in life I've worked hard to get here I know that I can speak to other people, I can educate other people, there's a science behind it. I know that I've read and done my um, due diligence as far as 
an advocate. I can speak to other people. I can tell them I'm a living witness that you equals you. Undetectable means untransmittable. And I can say that because I am a living proof of that. Now it's not even HIV, it's other diseases that are affecting and plaguing the community. Because I, I the, the younger generation, they don't believe anymore. They don't believe things can happen to them anymore. They've lost their, um, they've been desensitized to everything. So it's like, oh, well, that can happen. Okay, and then I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it when it comes. And then when it comes to you and it hits you, now you've got to deal with it. And now you don't know how because you don't have the tools. You didn't want to get those tools. You didn't want to take those classes. You didn't want to understand. You didn't want to listen. So it becomes harder, I know, for advocates and I know for caseworkers and social workers when the younger group starts coming in because they are so adamant um, in their um, ways of thinking. You know, they're just different. They're a lot different than we were. Okay, so that is the, the first little part here. It's, it's still very rough, obviously, um, but it does give a, oops, a picture. Um, Got to stop my share, that's the problem. Yeah, so, Allie, do you want to jump in or do we want to take questions from people first before we try to frame it up? I, I can jump in while people are sort of coming back if they went to Vimeo or um, putting okay. and formulating any questions. So one of the things that's really interesting about bringing Tashina into the story that we're telling here in Toledo um, is that she highlights a, a very large portion of the population who um, was invisible early on in our understandings of HIV. So back in 1980, 1981, 1982, um, we were mostly focused on white gay men and hemophiliacs um, and Haitian people in terms of um, thinking about who could contract HIV. We actually didn't even include female body people at all in our early understandings of, who, of um, HIV illness um, as, as sort of the CDC understood it. It wasn't until the late 1980s that we actually started to like include things really specific to the female body um, that would expand our understandings of the effects of HIV illness. So um, a, a really important black feminist political scientist, Kathy Cohen wrote a book in 1999 called The Boundaries of Blackness. And in that book, she talks about, you know, by the mid 1990s, black women were the fastest growing population with HIV. And we started to have um, the black caucus down in, in, um, in Washington sort of started to pay attention to HIV differently. Um, and, and people were sort of asking this question of like, oh my gosh, how did this happen, right? And so then folks like Oprah, um, made popular this idea of, oh, it's it's all of these married black men on the down low, right? Which was just a complete myth um, and fabrication, but she sort of blew that up um, it, so that people kind of thought, oh, that must be what's actually going on, right? Is that we have these um, uh, kind of like immoral cheating men, right? Who really just need to be out. Um, and there's lots of biphobia wrapped up in that, et cetera. Um, but what Kathy Cohen tells us is that that was never true. Black women were affected early on. They just were invisible in the data that we were collecting. And they were invisible for a number of reasons. One, it's really hard to get an HIV diagnosis if you don't have access to testing. And early on, we didn't have a test for HIV, right? So if you were somebody who passed away from HIV-related illness, it was probably something like pneumonia, right? So it wouldn't even be understood as HIV-related illness. Um, another factor was, um, you know, we didn't have the right diagnostic criteria available. Um, a lot of um, female-bodied people lack access to long-term medical care in general. Um, so uh, there were other things like um, sort of increasing poverty and the demonization of black women that were creating, that were making it much more difficult for black women to be seen as part of the story of HIV. So in 1999, Kathy Cohen sort of corrects our understanding of that and says, this isn't new. They've always been a large part of this population. We just haven't been paying attention to it. What's really interesting about thinking about Tashina as part of our story about David's house is that David's house really began thinking primarily it would serve um, 
male bodied people. And in fact, um, there were early discussions among board members about, well, shouldn't only serve gay people, right? And eventually they, they sort of determined, of course, it wouldn't only serve gay people, it would serve anybody with HIV, but they were really set up for single people. And so when they start to realize that there's a growing need of female bodied people, in the Toledo area that needed HIV services and housing, they realized that they couldn't provide housing because a lot of these people came with children and they couldn't house children in David's house. And so they started a campaign called Help David's House Grow um, in the mid 1990s. And the idea was that they would build apartment complexes um, onto, on the David's House property, right? Well, eventually, after a couple of years, they let go of that campaign, um, and they, the money that they raised, they used to build on an annex. And when you ask folks today, well, do you remember the Davis House Grows campaign? Do you remember, you know, everyone's like, oh, yeah, that was successful because they built on the annex. But the original plan for Davis House Grows was to house Black women and their children, right, according to board meeting minutes and fundraising plans for that. So it becomes another invisible part of the story of David's house. So I think bringing Tashina into the story um, really helps us get at some of these larger conversations about the invisibility of Black women um, in our culture at large, in the story of HIV, here in the Toledo community, right, and sort of thinking about how we can rectify that invisibility um, through uh, this kind of documentary. And the other thing that's really interesting about Tashina, when we first met her three summers ago, four, how long ago was that, Holly? It hasn't been four. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it has not been four. It was um, the pandemic. <laughs> it was um, the summer of 19 when we, yeah. yeah. Um, when we first met her, she came um, with a copy of her own book in her purse. So she had actually already published her own memoir. Um, which I think she had like self-published it. And I think that's, that's sort of a really amazing, just one more amazing way that Tashina shares her willingness to share her story for the sake of um, larger understandings of sort of HIV illness, but also like historical invisibility, right? So um, Tashina has been somebody that's been um, telling her story for a long time in that way. And we're really sort of, I think, blessed to have her um, as part of our film. So that's the, the sort of framing that I can provide um, just off the top here. I'm wondering um, what else people might want to know or what questions or comments they have about the clip that, that Holly did put together and share. She mentioned having a daughter. So does she have other children too? Yeah, th that'll come more apparent uh, with the longer cut. But yeah, she has a son and a daughter. Um, her son is older and he was uh, born when she was still in high school. Um, and then she was assaulted, which resulted in uh, a pregnancy. And then she found out that she was HIV positive. Um, and then she had her daughter who was born HIV negative. And Holly, do we get a time frame at all for like when her daughter was born? Does she ever tell us that? She does. Um, I, it's sometime in the early 90s, early mid 90s. Yep. By the, ter by the early mid-90s, we knew ways to prevent the transmission um, mm -hmm. if somebody knew their status. We knew ways of preventing the transmission um, from um, gestating parent to fetus. So um, even though there were plenty of people that also didn't know the status and, and had children, gestated children, well, they were HIV positive and miraculously those children didn't get the virus, right? So um, it's just, that was just kind of a crapshoot. But um, by the mid-1990s, we had we knew how we could prevent um, fetal transmission. Right, and I think it was AZT mm -hmm. that, that prevented the fetal transmission. <clears throat> so it wasn't necessarily helpful to um, the people who had HIV, but in the pregnancy transmission, they, they found out that, hey, that worked for that, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Um, I will say, and I hope that you guys can join us in December to hear more of her story as with, with her story, as like the other participants, HIV is just really kind of the tip of the iceberg um, <clears throat> of evidence that shows how amazing these people are. 
and what they had to survive in addition to the HIV to be here with us today. Um, I'll just, I'll share, Tashina's mother was hit by a semi truck when she was pregnant with Tashina and she was in a coma during her entire <clears throat> pregnancy and it was actually giving birth that brought her out of the coma. And so, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I, you know, she was just born to survive, you know, pretty amazing. Thank you so much for um, the clip you shared. I, it's very powerful, and I think it also um, can be will be very helpful because, in as much as the concentration is about um, HIV and AIDS, I think with what's happening with COVID nineteen pandemic, um, people have to be prepared to be able to bounce back and to be resilient and to empathize. Uh, because I can imagine that some of these um, uh, reactions to even those who have long haul um, COVID um, related uh, symptoms um, might um, have similar experiences. Um, we don't know how th that will pan out, you know, but uh, stigmatization is, uh, can be deadly and uh, not only for those who as stigmatizing others, and not only for those who are being stigmatized. Um, uh, so this is very, it's a teachable moment and, um, and your work I think is more relevant than ever with what's going on in our globally right sure. now. Thank you so kindly. You're welcome, thank you. Um, I think, Dr. Moji, thank you for, for highlighting that. I think one of the things that the film is highlighting for me and working on the film is um, the creative economies of care that developed around HIV that were often informal, um, that I think um, can inspire us to new ways of thinking about care um, in 2020 um, and, and forward with the COVID-19 pandemic. The other thing, I mean, I was just thinking as you were talking about stigma, um, and Tashina talks about stigma as well, um, some of the things I investigate in my work um, outside of this film with Holly is um, how um, stories circulate and how um, the, the kind of carefulness we all need, but particularly people who are multiply marginalized, need to take when sharing stories with medical professionals, right? Because we think we're sharing one thing and they receive and hear something else, right? And so um, the book that I, I wrote that just came out yesterday um, sort of thinks about, thank you. I, if you're not your own best self promoter, who else is gonna be, right? Um, so, um, which is called The Political Economy of Stigma, really looks at sort of the, the ways that when medical providers hear what you're saying, it can lead to very tangible material problems in how you're given medical care, right? And so um, some of the women that I worked with in and around Ohio who were living with HIV had really creative ways of navigating that, that we can also learn from. So it's not just sort of this like, I'm gonna be an open book and tell you sort of all of these things about my life. Um, it's a very created, creative and curated way of sort of sharing um, experiences with medical care providers um, while keeping up really important um, protective sort of barriers, right? So um, I think about that a lot. And that is um, sort of, I think we all just need to be careful of like, we're not just, we can't just sort of share our story and expect everything to be okay and everyone's going to get it right because it just doesn't work that way so thank you for your comments i put a link to Allie's book in the chat thanks holly you're welcome so Allie's knowledge and some other scholars that we've been interviewing are going to help frame the film in terms of voiceover um, we have a great deal of writing to do <laughs> next summer Hopefully we'll get the money to continue on. Hey, Holly, I have a question that nobody's asking, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, where are we in the production of the film? Like, are we going to, so like what, what stage are we at? I mean, I know what stage we're at, but what stage are we at? What's left to do? Um, what's like, what's the story there? I would say we're more than halfway through interviewing participants that we wanna connect with. Um, probably a good 70%. We still have a few odds and ends to wrangle. Um, we, we were very lucky, as Allie knows, that we reconnected or we connected initially with Sister Eileen Schreiber, 
who was the um, <clears throat> Catholic nun who brokered the deal between the church um, and the David's House board to get this to get David's House into being. And so we were able to interview her uh, via Zoom uh, just a few weeks ago. And she's in Missouri, she's 82 now. So hope, we're hoping to do a road trip down to get location B-roll of her. That's been difficult because the semester started and then the COVID rates are spiking. So, um, so our plan is if we get this ginormous grant that we applied for, um, that will be done with this in two more years and we'll do a feature length version. And if we don't get that grant, I'm just going to have to get like a 30 minute version out for regional PBS stations somehow. <laughs> so that's where we are. It's still hard to know exactly where we are because it's like any story, right? The more you investigate, the it's like other really important things come up that I kind of am led into. So. And another piece that we're also thinking to accompany the film with the ginormous grant, if we get it, but maybe some other way we'll be able to fundraise for this, is to use all of the footage that doesn't end up in the film to create a podcast, right? So that we can hear um, more of these characters on their own, right? So Tashina and others who we've interviewed have, have, you know, longer stories. We can release, you know, we can sort of frame those up as a podcast that people can listen to um, as part of, as like an a, accompaniment to the film, right? So that they can get to know some of these people a little bit more in depth. Um, because of course in the film, you're not gonna have just 16 minutes of Tashina talking and the beautiful way that she is, I love her cadence and like how she tells her story, but you know, in the film, it's going to be sort of interspersed. So um, the podcast will be another way to um, show showcase those stories, I think. Well, oh, I think you guys are doing marvelous work. And I hope you get your money. I hope very much that you get your money. <laughs> well, so some good intentional thoughts there. And if there's ever anything I can do to help, you know, you can count on me. But well, do you just, have a couple hundred thousand dollars? When we all love a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah, you know, it's it's amazing how money just has a way of stepping in there. Oh, and the mowers just arrived. <laughs> so I've been turning my... my oh, at your house. <laughs> like, what? You know, you can't win. Right. And they don't come on a set day either. Well, Paulette, no. I, you know, you've, you've been very supportive. Uh, not, this event has been important to me just to give me a deadline to get something done. Um, and then to move me into the, our December screenings, because we've been having December screenings for the last couple of years, because World, Aid, World AIDS Day is December 1st. Yes. Um, and then the other, you know, thank you for just coming to our events when we have them yeah. and bringing people. That's super important to build visibility um, and uh, just to keep the momentum going. But this is the biggest thing I've ever worked on. And... Um, you know, it's it's a lot. I'm really out of my comfort zone in many ways, but I'm I'm excited by it too. If we do get the grant, I can really step into like a director's role and not have to worry about editing. Um, whereas if we don't get the grant, I'm going to have to do most of the editing, which is going to take a tremendous amount of time. Well, I hope you get that grant. Thank you. And we will ask you again next year if you have stuff to show us. You know that. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm sure we will. Yeah, I just at some point we'll weave weave the pieces together a little and bit more. But it, yeah. yeah, I was gonna say and save the date. So December first, our screening is going to be at McMaster Auditorium downtown in the downtown library. So we really hope to be able to bring a, a large amount of people out to from the community and the university to sort of see some of the progress of the film because I think we we also did an online screening this summer to mark the. Um, uh, 25th anniversary of the discovery of HIV as a, you know, the first um, account of HIV in the um, MMWR. So um, and we were able to talk with Dr. MacArthur and we filmed that conversation and he was like the first AIDS doctor here in this region. Um, so we have some really interesting stuff um, that's just piling up and we just need to share yeah. with everyone. You guys really do fascinating stuff. 